How's it going everybody? Welcome back to Taxes Made Simple. I'm your host Carlton Dennis. In today's video, we're gonna discuss how to leverage real estate to avoid W-2 taxes. I've committed probably the last 12 months of my life studying passive activity loss rules. And one thing that I really have gotten really good at is showing other investors, showing W-2 taxpayers how to use real estate to avoid taxes on their W-2 income, their 1099 income, their crypto, their stock income, their entire portfolio. If you're somebody who has a normal W-2 job and you want to figure out how you can invest in real estate and use real estate to offset your taxable income, this video is for you. We're gonna take the time to go over what the passive activity loss rules are, what you need to know to position yourself as a real estate investor to use your losses to offset other forms of income. Let's dive in. All right, guys, I'm going to jump right into this. Part of the reason why I'm doing this video is because a majority of my taxpayers are high net worth individuals and they're high net worth from a bunch of different reasons. Some of them are W-2 taxpayers, which means they're making a killing working for somebody else. Some of them are 1099 contractors, which means they're already in S corporations and they're spending tons of money on cars and cell phones and all these different things to try to reduce their tax bill. And then I have some of my other business owners who have been business owners for a long time who are making millions. If you fall into one of these three categories, then you're gonna to wanna to listen to this video because I'm gonna show you why the wealthy have been playing a game with real estate for years and why certain people just don't understand what it is about real estate that makes it so sexy from a tax perspective. Maybe you were never taught how real estate can be used to avoid taxes. You were just taught that real estate is a great place for you to park your money long term. My goal is to make sure that you understand that it's not just a long-term investment for your money. It's an investment that's going to help you avoid taxes on other sources of income. So what we're going to do today in this video is we're going to dive into the iPad and I'm going to go over what the passive activity loss rules are. I'm going to try to explain something that's extremely complex, tax laws that have been in place since the 80s and make sure that you guys understand it and walk away from this video exactly knowing what you need to do if you were to go into real estate. Let's jump in. All right, guys, so I'm in the iPad right now, and the first thing that I wanna talk about is the difference between passive income and non-passive income. And part of the reason why I wanna do this is because the, the government created two different buckets back in 1987. In 1987, there was the Tax Reform Act that occurred with Ronald Reagan, and when Ronald Reagan implemented the Tax Reform Act, he got rid of a lot of tax loopholes. A part of getting rid of the tax loopholes, he implemented the passive activity loss rules. And the passive activity loss rules separated passive income from non-passive income. And that is how it's defined inside of the IRS tax book. So from our non-passive income, this is the income that you and I are very familiar with. This bucket that sits in the non-passive side is filled with W-2 income, 1099 income, stock income, crypto income, social security income, which I still don't understand why social security is taxed when we're already paying taxes into social security. But anyways, this is our non-passive income bucket. Our non-passive income bucket is filled with things that require us to do work. It requires work to have a W-2 job, a 1099 job, stocks, crypto, social security. These types of income are subject to federal and state taxes, and in some cases, social security and Medicare tax. Now, your passive income on the other hand is income that you receive from work that you're typically not doing. When you have passive income, you're typically investing your money into a rental property or you're investing your money into a business in which you, taxpayer, do not materially participate. So if you're investing your money into a business or into real estate, it's going to be considered passive and normally this is rental real estate that we're looking at over here on this side. One of the things that we have to understand as it pertains to non-passive income versus passive income is that the government created a line and the line states that your passive income and passive losses that could be generated from rental real estate cannot hop over to offset your non-passive income, okay? So 1987 changed a lot of things. And you guys will learn more about this if you guys are joining the Tax Alchemy program. But the losses that you generate from rental real estate cannot offset your W-2 crypto stock 1099 and social security income. You might be thinking, Carlton, why would I wanna be at a loss on my real estate? Taxpayer, I completely understand what you're thinking. You're not gonna be at a loss 
on your rental, you're gonna be at a paper loss with your real estate. You see, when it comes to rental real estate, there's paper losses and then there's operational losses. If you're running a rental operation and your expenses for running that operation exceed the income you're receiving, yeah, you're at an operational loss on your books. But if you're running a rental property and you're cash flowing, and when it's time to file your tax returns, you're showing a loss, even though you are cash flow positive, you have what's called a rental loss, a phantom expense, which typically comes from depreciation. I spent a lot of time discussing depreciation on this channel. And part of the reason why is because many business owners are leveraging depreciation to reduce their taxes. When you buy equipment, when you buy tools, when you buy these items inside of your business, the government doesn't just let you write everything off in one year. Typically, you have to depreciate items that last longer than one year. A computer like a MacBook Pro is going to last longer than one year. A Sony camera is going to last longer than one year. An automobile is going to last longer than one year. The government has a line to change some tax laws that allow for you to write things off in one year, code section 179 plus bonus depreciation, which many taxpayers have leveraged. But something like rental real estate is going to last longer than one year. As a matter of fact, rental real estate is depreciated over the course of 27.5 years for residential real estate. And depreciation is taken over the course of 39 years for non-residential real estate, okay? This is a long time, guys. 27 and a half years. 39 years for a non-residential rental property. So many taxpayers who are like you and you and I, they do research, especially when you get into real estate, you're gonna start doing some research on how you can improve your property, on how you can improve your asset that you just spent money on. How can I squeeze more orange juice from this orange tree? And that's exactly what leads you to understanding more about depreciation. Your curiosity around depreciation will spike. When learning about depreciation, you'll start to realize that there are certain taxpayers who take depreciation over 27 and a half years, the long durations of time. And then there's certain taxpayers who take depreciation over 39 years, the long duration of almost 40 years of their life. But then you'll start to realize that there are some taxpayers who are taking depreciation in five, seven, 10, 15 years as opposed to the 27 and a half or 39 years that every other taxpayer might be taking their depreciation over the allotted amount of time that the government has stipulated. Carlton, why is this allowed? Well, why is it allowed for taxpayers to write off a vehicle that weighs over 6,000 pounds in one year? The tax code allows for it. And the tax code allows for you, taxpayer, to realign your rental property. So rather than writing off all of the components that make up your property, such as the roof, such as the door, such as the windows, such as the lighting, the drywall, the appliances, all of these components, your roof, your windows, your doors, your appliances, they don't last 27.5 years. They do not last 39 years. They do typically last five, seven, 10, 15 years, depending on what item inside of your property we're talking about. Now, if we're talking about the roof, the roof is gonna last 15 years, but it's currently being written off over 27 and a half years if you have a residential property. Appliances typically are depreciated over five and seven years, but maybe your appliances, your washer, your dryer, your refrigerator inside of your rental property is being depreciated over 27 and a half years or 39 years. Why would I want to have items inside of my house that I'm gonna to have to replace every five to 10 years written off for me over the course of 27 and a half years? That's exactly why real estate investors start doing research. That's exactly why they start questioning things. Taxpayer, if you're watching this, I want you to question things. Why do I have to do that? You'll find out other people were questioning that exact same thing, which led to the tax code being changed. Enters the cost 
segregation study. What does the cost segregation study mean, Carlton? The cost segregation study means that you are getting the cost associated with your investment property, the actual building structure, the structure, you're segregating all of the components inside of this structure out and you're choosing to write them off over one, five, seven, 10, 15, and 27.5, okay, or 39. So we're creating different ways for us to write off the components inside of our property, but someone has to perform the study, okay? Someone like a tax professional company like myself, as well that's partnered with an engineering firm, we're partnered with an engineering firm. We will send out our engineers to your house to take photos of the inside of the house, the outside of the house, so we can determine all of the little tiny, little bitty assets that make up your property. All of the real property is what the government calls it. So all of this real property that we have, we can now reallocate into a one, five, seven, 10, 15, 27 and a half, 39 year bucket. On the tax returns, that creates a loss inside of your passive bucket. But on the non-passive side, you still have your W-2, your 1099, your crypto, your stocks. We're still in a situation where performing a cost segregation still does not allow us to use the losses to roll over to offset the W-2, the 1099, the cryptos, the stocks, and all the other income you got going on. So how do we get around these passive activity loss rules the government created? We first have to understand them. There are three ways to get around the passive activity loss rules that I want you to know. And the way to get around the passive act activity loss rules is number one, is if you make less than 150K AGI. I am not speaking to every single taxpayer when I'm writing this. I know a majority of you who are watching this make over $150,000 adjusted gross income, or you make over that when you file married filing joint with your spouse. So not too many taxpayers are gonna be able to qualify for, for number one. Number two states on entire disposition. What does that mean? That means we're selling our property, i.e. we're selling. When you sell your rental property, you can use the passive losses that have been accumulating in the passive bucket to offset the other forms of income, the capital gain income that you're gonna have from the sale of the property. Now, the other one is by qualifying as a rep. I am gonna start using acronyms with you guys so you understand how we as tax professionals communicate. REP stands for Real Estate Professional. Whoa, Carlton, am I gonna to need to go back to school? Am I gonna to need to get my real estate agent's license? Am I gonna to need to be a broker? Sir, no, you're not. Ma'am, no, you are not. Taxpayer, no, you are not. You see, what's really cool about understanding the tax code is if we just follow some of these rules, we can unlock what we're looking for. Hearing real estate professional, many taxpayers who are watching this are thinking, Oh, I'm probably gonna have to study and, and pass some tests to become a real estate professional. I'm gonna need some type of experience. It's gonna require some amount of net worth that I don't have yet. <laughs> there is no dollar amount associated with qualifying as a real estate professional. There's no income requirement to qualify as a real estate professional. There's no test you need to pass. There's no schooling you need to have. And there's no background in real estate you need to have. Qualifying as a real estate professional, all it comes down to is two tests. Both of these two tests have to be passed in order to unlock your passive activity losses to be able to turn them into non-passive losses to offset your W-2, 1099 crypto and stock income. Let's go over those two tests. A real estate professional is one, somebody who's spending 750 hours in their real property trade or business, biz, in which they materially blah, participate. 
pardon my spelling, I just want to type fast. All right, guys. So rule number one states that you have to spend 750 hours, 750 hours, that's the magical number, just make sure you got it, 750 hours in your real property trade or business in which you materially participate, okay? So there's some words here that we have to understand. What is a real property trader business? And what in the world does material participation means? Okay. I'm going to simplify this for you because I, I could spend all day talking about material participation, but essentially material participation means that you're managing your own real estate. So you just have to get your head wrapped around that. Okay. 750 hours is pretty easy to understand. We all have a clock on our wrist. So, Understanding that 750 hours in the year is what's needed, you can do the math, that's gonna come out to about 14 hours a week. Real property trader business. If you're managing your rental, you're running a real property trader business. So we just broke down this very simply. 750 hours, materially participating kind of means that I'm managing. Real property trader business means that I have an investment property that I'm either managing, brokering, leasing, being a real estate agent on, there are 11 real property trader businesses. Okay, so let's jump into test number two. Test number two states that we need to spend more than half our time in our real property trade or business in which we materially participate in. Okay, so test number two, more than half of our time is spent in this real estate business in which we are materially participating in, okay? I'm going to go ahead and say it now. Most W2, 1099, day traders who are day trading often do not have time to show the government that they're spending more than half of their time in real estate than any other thing. The reason why, guys, is because most W-2 taxpayers work 40 hours a week, okay? That's almost over 8,000 hours a year, okay? So you're gonna have to show the government that you're spending more time in real estate, 41 hours in real estate, than you are in your W-2 1099 day job. That's hard to do. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and say this. For taxpayers who have a spouse, it's very easy to qualify your spouse if one of your spouses is working from home or is not currently working at the moment, maybe possibly taking care of the, ch the children, maybe a husband who's taking care of the kids or a wife who's taking care of the kids. This is when the wife can qualify or the husband can qualify for these two tests right here to get ourselves to using our passive losses. That's the whole reason we would even go down this road. We wanna be able to use our passive losses, okay? Now, I wanna speak to the taxpayer who does not qualify for this. What can you do? What can you do to get to a point where your non-passive income is being offset by passive losses that you might have generated from doing cost segregation studies on your investment properties? Well, there is a loophole. It's funny even saying the word loophole, but when you think about it, the government has made it very clear what things we can't do within the tax code and what things we can do within the tax code. In the tax code, the government states that short-term real estate, STR, does not count as a passive activity under code section 469, which by the way, is the entire code section that we're talking about here today, 469, just if you want to remember this, the government states that short-term rentals do not qualify as a passive activity under code section 469. Hmm, Carlton, what are you getting at? <laughs> I think we just found our way. That's right. Guys, last year I had probably over 70 clients buy investment properties based on some of my instructing because of the tax savings that they would receive. I had clients literally go into short-term real estate for one very particular reason. Short-term real estate means that you, one, do not 
need to meet the reps two part test. <laughs> Woo, Carlton, so you mean I don't have to spend 750 hours? You mean to tell me I don't need to spend half of my time? No taxpayer, you don't have to spend 750 hours. You don't have to spend half of your time. You taxpayer only need to materially participate. That's correct. By materially participating in your short-term rental and by running a short-term rental for an average customer use day of seven days or less, you can unlock your passive losses to offset your W-2 income, to offset your, your 1099 income. So let me give you an example. And we're gonna talk about material participation because I already know where your head's at. I already know what you're thinking, Carlton. What, what's going on with this whole material, material participation? You did say that you can talk about it for a whole hour. Are we gonna learn it in this hour? Maybe. Okay, so let's just say I did a cost segregation study on an investment property that's $600,000. So I ended up generating a $200,000 paper loss on my tax returns. And me and my wife are filing taxes this year. She makes 100K, I make 100K. So we have $200,000 in W-2 income that we paid into. What are the taxes we've already paid into? We've already paid into federal taxes by the I, the R, and the S. We already paid into state taxes and we paid into Social Security and Medicare, okay? These are the taxes that the W-2 taxpayer has already paid into. If I have a $200,000 loss on the passive loss side with my rental real estate, I'm not even gonna pay taxes on that side. So everything's gonna flow over if I'm leveraging a short-term rental or if I qualify for rep status. That means that this 200K, let's just put it down here for perspective, is getting offset by a $200,000 loss. Carlton, wait a second. Carlton, I have taxes being withheld on every single paycheck. Okay, that's up to you if you want those taxes being withheld after understanding how much losses you have working for you. That's up to you if you want to wait 365 days for the IRS to file your tax return so you can get your refund coming back to you based on the federal, state taxes that you paid. Social Security and Medicare tax, you're not gonna get that back. But the federal and state taxes, you will get back. That's correct. So you have wiped away your taxes and you're at a 0% taxable income. Carlton, is this real? Is this really real? Guys, when I was learning about this, I thought like literally, literally, I had tapped into a superpower that I didn't know I had. You know how like when you watch like some superhero movies that the, like the superhero doesn't get his powers until he's like 17 or 18 or he gets hit by like a bus and finds out he's all of a sudden got super strength? That was what was happening to me when I started studying code section 469. So much that I've, I've read code section 469 forward, I read it backwards, and then I read it forward again, and then I read it backwards again, and then I realized the government put out an audit technique guide on how to audit all this, and then I read that, and then I read it over and over and over again, and then I just came, I kept getting to the same results. We can leverage passive losses with short-term rentals or by qualifying as a real estate professional. We just have to understand what material participation means. We just have to understand how much time we need to spend in our rentals. Being a real estate professional does not mean that you have to be a real estate agent. Does having a real estate agent license help? Absolutely, it definitely contributes to 750 hours in your real property trader business because now you have a real estate agent's business too on top of just managing your real estate portfolio, right? So absolutely. There are things that you can be doing. One of the things that I've done to help you is I've created an entire free training on exactly what material participation is, how to leverage real estate to avoid W-2 1099 income, and the link is below. So you guys can jump on this free training. It's free, and I'm gonna give you access to be able to understand this information. If you're following me right now, like literally, can you pat yourself on the back right now? Like literally give, reach over and try to make sure you can reach over and pat because this is not easy stuff. This is advanced tax law. If I've broken it down in a way that you can understand, 
<laughs> I'm tooting my horn a little bit, so maybe you've already hit the like or the, the subscribe button. But what I want you to know is that there are other taxpayers playing this game. They're playing this game. Some people who are sitting back watching this are thinking, but if I front load all this depreciation, doesn't mean I won't have all this depreciation later. There's always a way for you to get more depreciation. I have a method called the RAD method that I teach you inside of my program that you will get to learn about. By clicking on the link below, you'll learn a little bit more about how you can leverage these passive losses in a free webinar. If you wish to join the program with some of my other students who are leveraging this, you're more than welcome to. But we are teaching this game each and every single day. Real estate will be a part of how I retire. And if real estate will be a part of how you retire, wouldn't you want to retire early by offsetting more of your W-2 and 1099 income right now, knowing that you don't have to spend 750 hours, knowing that you don't have to spend half of your time in real estate? There is a way out of it. My name is Carlton Dennis. If you guys like this video, I want you to do something. Like, comment, subscribe. You know I'm going to come back with more content for you. I got you. I'll see you on the next video.